Okay then, so in terms of who owned the castle in the early 17th century, you've got the list of owners, the Earls of Rutland, John, 4th Earl of Rutland, Roger, 5th Earl of Rutland, and then Francis, 6th Earl of Rutland. Uh, but then after Francis, the, um, the castle passed into the ownership of George Villiers, the first Duke of Buckingham, and then George Villiers, the second Duke of Buckingham. And this is because Francis's daughter, Catherine Manners, married George Villiers, the first Duke of Buckingham in 1620. She renounced her Catholicism to do so. And the castle was um, given to George Villiers, the first Duke of Buckingham, as part of her dowry um, that she brought when she married George Villiers, the first Duke of Buckingham. Now, the castle would eventually pass to their son on the, the death of um, George Villiers, the first Duke of Buckingham. He was uh, killed in 1628. The castle would eventually pass to their son, George Villiers, the second Duke of Buckingham. We just talk a little bit more about Catherine Villiers, born Manners. She inherited the Darius barony when her father died in 1632. As we said, Catherine married um, George Villiers, the first Duke of Buckingham in 1620, and Helmsley Castle was passed to him as part of her dowry. There's little evidence that George Villiers um, ever spent any time at the castle. When George Villiers the first died in 1628, the castle passed to their son, George Villiers, the second Duke of Buckingham. Catherine would later remarry and went to live in Ireland, but Catherine Villiers did keep rooms and servants at Helmsley Castle in her later life, as inventories of the castle refer to her belongings being there. Other sources record the furniture within the castle as being old, which suggests that it wasn't seen as being particularly important during this time and that it wasn't regularly lived in. And the castle was mostly not lived in, except for a few servants that kind of maintained the castle um, on the eve of the English Civil War. So Helmsley Castle was already kind of fading um, before the English Civil War, but its purpose is still obviously largely domestic. Now, the English Civil War breaks out between royalists and parliamentarians between 1642 and 1646, and then again in 1648. Now, the parliamentarians won, and the King Charles I was executed on 30th of January 1649. Now, Yorkshire in the Civil War was um, very much the sort of base of the royalists, and King Charles I actually moved the capital up to York during the English Civil War. And the castle was garrisoned by royalists under command of local man Sir Jordan Crossland, who was a royalist. In July 1644, the Royalists were defeated by the Parliamentarians at the Battle of Marston Moor, and after this, York fell to the Parliamentarians. The Parliament's army leader, Sir Thomas Fairfax, laid siege to Helmsley Castle in August 1644. It was a siege which lasted for around about three months up until November 1644. Attempt to lift the siege by Royalist um, forces um, from Knaresborough failed, and Jordan Crossland negotiated terms of surrender on the 6th of November 1644 after this failure with the people inside the castle running out of supplies. So in terms of the surrender, it was described as a surrender with honour. So Crossland officers and men could leave all their goods and join the Royalist garrison at Scarborough. And I remember Scarborough is one of our key castles that we're comparing Helmsley to. And Scarborough as well was garrisoned by Royalist forces during the English Civil War. Carriages were provided to carry the Royalist supplies out. And the order in terms of the surrender was that Helmsley Castle was to be absolutely demolished so that neither side could use it. The curtain walls and the East Tower were slighted. Um, which means they basically are destroyed and fragments of the East Tower can still be seen in the inner ditch today. The mansion uh, built by Edward Manners not being in itself a military target was preserved and prisoners on both sides would be released. Now there's no evidence that the Duchess of Buckingham was living there at the start of um, the English Civil War and um, just a few servants belonging to the Duchess of, of Buckingham, Catherine um, Villiers. Were, were were there, um, although her furniture were, was there, which suggested that she had spent some time there, but the sources also suggest, as we said, that the furniture was old. The castle defences in the East Tower were demolished after the surrender. Royalist prisoners were actually held in the basement of the West Tower between 1648 and 1649. Um, George Villiers II himself, um, who was actually the um, owner of the castle during the, the English Civil War, fled the country in 1648 after Charles I was defeated, but he returned in 1657 and married Mary Fairfax, the daughter of Thomas Fairfax. Now, he was briefly imprisoned in 1658, but Thomas Fairfax helped him get released in 1659, and Villiers regained all of his properties at the restoration of Charles II in 1660. 
We just have a look at a little bit of the site evidence to do with the slighting of the East Tower. So the museum in the castle contains an unexploded mortar bomb which was found within the ruined tower in the northeast corner of the castle. Now damage to the tower suggests it was deliberately blown up after the Civil War siege, perhaps by a similar type of mortar bomb that was placed underneath um, the East Tower and then used to basically bring down that, that sort of um, wall of the East Tower. And the Civil War cannon um, that were actually used within the actual Civil War itself were often more used to scare the enemy due to the noise. The cannon were clumsy and difficult to move and were pretty effective in siege warfare. We have found sight evidence of cannonballs in, within the castle ditches. Now, source evidence of parish registers record the death of just one soldier during the siege. Sir Thomas Fairfax was also shot in the soldier, however, during the siege and carried off all but dead to York. Um, Sir Thomas Fairfax was the main parliamentary commander at the siege at Helmsley Castle. Um, the parliamentarians um, were staying nearby at Nunnington Hall. Um, a later description from Thomas Gill in, uh, in 1652 suggests that for some time he vibrated between life and death. Now this artistic interpretation clearly shows what the East Tower looked like before it was slighted. So it was a D-shaped tower. You can see the distinctive ear turrets there. And you can see that the effect of blowing up the East Tower was essentially to bring down um, the, um, the sort of um, circular wall, the, the D-shaped kind of wall of uh, the castle on the outside. And we can see evidence of debris still in the ditch. There would have been a lot more of that, um, but much of that has been cleared away or some of the large parts of them um, of that debris would have been probably used to you know build houses and in Helmsley and surrounding areas um, but we can see that slighted east tower and the idea of slighting it means that it can't be used um, for defense any longer so it basically renders the castle um, less effective militarily but also the slighting of the east tower kind of symbolically removes quite a lot of the power of the castle and starts to lead to the sort of ruin of the castle that happens in the years after the English Civil War. Now the castle's walls weren't actually damaged during the actual siege, so site evidence of the castle walls shows a lack of pock marks, suggesting the siege itself saw a little firing, um, and it was mostly peaceful. We know that only one person died. So the curtain walls in the East Tower were actually deliberately ruined by Parliament after the surrender, with Fairfax destroying the symbol of the Lord's power with the East Tower the Lords of Helmsley. The explosion which destroyed the East Tower would have shaken the town and the surrounding villages. It would have been a really loud and large explosion and the view of the castle and the Lord's power over them was changed forever. And this is why it's such a dramatic turning point and that um, site evidence that we can see there really dramatically shows the scale of the damage that is done to the East Tower by the slighting of it in 1644. Here's an artistic interpretation of the surrender with honour at Helmsley Castle. So we can see here the two different sides in the Civil War. And we can see here the Royalist forces being able to march out on horseback uh, and this, um, this so-called surrender with honour being able to leave um, the castle and they went off to Scarborough. So focus on a little bit more source evidence here. Um, so we've got the parliamentary newspaper, Perfect Occurrences, week ending 6th of September said, our cannon are planted before Helmsley Castle and we hope speedily to take it. So Thomas Fairfax is most unfortunately shot on the shoulder by a bullet from the enemy in Helmsley Castle. Isn't clear what the cause of the injury was. One account is that it was whilst planning the attack. Another is that it was whilst leading it. Thomas Fairfax wrote a letter about the siege of Helmsley Castle and he said, I have at Helmsley 700 foot which means 700 foot soldiers and 300 horse, which have grown so close to the castle as I have most hoped to prevail there the soonest, though I find it very strong and informed, well stored with ammunition and victuals, which means sort of food and, and water. And then there's the letter from Jordan Crossland requesting an honourable surrender. And this is what he requested. And we can actually see a copy of that letter, um, which is at the museum at Helmsley Castle. And he said, all officers can march out with their arms, horses and goods belonging to them and be given safe passage to Scarborough. Soldiers can march out with arms loaded, matches lit, colours flying and drums beating. Any people that went into the castle for protection will be given freedom to leave and go to their homes and that Thomas Fairfax will guarantee their protection and that the servants and goods of the Lady Duchess Buckingham will remain safe within the castle. And that's how we know that there were servants and goods of the Lady Duchess, Catherine Villiers, Duchess of Buckingham um, at that time as well. So it is a huge turning point. Um, what happens after the um, siege of Helmsley Castle is the castle was given to Thomas Fairfax, who subsequently gave the castle to his daughter, Mary Fairfax. Now, as luck would have it, George Villiers II 
ended up marrying Mary Fairfax and therefore took repossession of Helmsley Castle. So in the years after the English Civil War, the castle returned to George Villiers II. George Villiers II regained his standing after the death of Oliver Cromwell and became the Lord Lieutenant of Yorkshire. And George retired to Helmsley in 1685 in ill health and poor finance. He may have lived at the castle. There is some source evidence they lived at Kirby Moorside as well. And he died in 1687 having caught a chill whilst out hunting and he left no heirs. Now, in 1689, an Act of Parliament allowed the estate to be sold to settle George Villiers II's debts. In 1695, a London banker called Charles Duncan purchased Helmsley and its 40,000 acre estate for the huge sum of £90,000. Now, Charles's main residence was Downton in Wiltshire, but this was to be his northern residence. He didn't really do much with it, but he left the estate to his brother-in-law and business partner, Thomas Brown, who changed his name to Thomas Duncan. Now, Thomas Duncan thought the Tudor mansion was unsuitable for him to be living in. So instead, he began building Duncan Park, which is a Baroque country house set in the former parks of the castle and the lands of Revo Abbey. And he based the building on the design of Hubie Hall with the advice of architect John Vanbrugh, who designed Castle Howard. So just a reinforcement of why Helmsley Castle is a turning point. Well, firstly, um, when you think about a turning point, you need to think about what came before it. So Helmsley Castle's main use was domestic beforehand, and this is a change in use to military. It's the only time um, that Helmsley Castle saw fighting. So it's that change in use from domestic to military. Then there's the dramatic and short-term impact of the siege of Helmsley Castle. It's a turning point. It's the only time that Helmsley Castle actually sees any proper military action. It's the time when Helmsley Castle is really linked into a key national event, the English Civil War. And the slightly of the East Tower is the most dramatic event and most biggest change that, that actually happens to Helmsley Castle sort of physically during this time as well. And then you've got the long-term impact that the slightly of the East Tower leads the castle to fall into disrepair and ruin. Um, so, for example, if the castle hadn't fallen into ruin or hadn't been slighted, then maybe when the castle was sold to the Duncans, they may well have decided to reside in the castle. Um, you know, if you think about places like Annick Castle that weren't um, badly, you know, weren't involved in English Civil War and, and remained standing and still, you know, the castle obviously been remodelled quite a lot in the 19th century, but that still stands as a family home today for the Percy family. So you can say that long term, the slightly the East Tower calls the ca causes the castle to fall into disrepair and become this romantic ruin in the 18th century and then eventually become their sort of heritage, community, lots of community use in the late 19th century and this tourist site as well. So that helps you focus on what's in the yellow boxes there about um, what's happening with Helmsley Castle during the 17th century and the English Civil War. Thanks for listening. Bye bye.